I keep talking about the dark things we have to remember because somehow they're easier to talk about and because maybe they're the things we're most apt to keep secret. In part three of Sacred Stories, author Frederick Beekner continues his journey into the past. In this poignant story of his teenage daughter, Beekner discovers the presence of God during a dark and confusing time. This discovery reveals his own need for spiritual healing, demonstrating the importance of memory in restoring a person to wholeness. There are two pieces of stained glass that sit propped up in one of the windows of, in the room where I used to write. One of those pieces of stained glass, which I think I asked somebody to give me one Christmas, shows the cowardly lion from The Wizard of Oz with his feet bound with rope and his face streaming with tears as a few of the winged monkeys who have bound him hover around him in the background. The other piece of stained glass is a diptych that somebody gave me once and it always causes me a twinge of embarrassment when I notice it because it seems a little too complacently religious. <laughs> On one of its panels are written the words, may the blessing of God crown this house and on the other, fortunate is he whose work is blessed and whose household is prospered by the Lord. The cowardly lion is me, of course, crying, tied up, afraid. I'm crying because at the time I'm speaking of, some 15 years ago, a lot of sad and scary things were going on in our house that I felt helpless either to understand or to do anything about. Yet, despite its rather self-satisfied religiosity, I believe the diptych was telling a truth about that time, too. I believe the blessing of God was indeed crowning our house, even then, in the sense that the sad and scary things themselves, as it turned out, were a fearsome blessing. And all the time those things were happening, the very fact that I was able to save my sanity by continuing to write, among other things, a novel called Godric, made my work blessed and a means of grace, at least for me because nothing I've ever written came out of a darker time or brought me more light and comfort. What happened was that one of our, our daughters began to stop eating. There was nothing scary about it at first. It was just the sort of thing any girl who thought she'd be prettier if she lost a few pounds might do. Nothing for breakfast maybe a carrot or a Diet Coke for lunch, for supper, maybe a little salad with low-calorie dressing. But then, as the months went by, it became very scary. Anorexia nervosa is the name of the sickness she was suffering from, needless to say. And the best understanding that I've been able to arrive at goes something like this. Young people, especially, crave to be free and independent. They crave also to be taken care of and safe. And the dark magic of anorexia is that it satisfies both of these cravings at once. By not eating, you take your stand against the world that is telling you what to do and what to be. And by not eating, you also make your body so much smaller and lighter and weaker, that in effect it becomes a child's body again, and the world flocks to your rescue. This double victory is so great that not even self-destruction apparently seems too high a price to pay for it. Be that as it may, she got more thin and more thin until she began to have the skull-like face and fleshless arms and legs of a victim of Buchenwald. 
And at the same time, the cowardly lion got more afraid and sad, felt more and more helpless. No rational argument, no dire medical warning, no pleading or cajolery or bribery would make this young woman he loved eat again, but only seemed to strengthen her determination not to eat. This young woman on whose life his own life in so many ways depended. He could not solve her problem because, like any father, he was, of course, himself so much a part of her problem. And then finally, when she had to be hospitalized, a doctor called from far away where she was one morning to say that unless they started feeding her against her will, she would die. It was as clear cut as that. Tears ran down the cowardly lion's face as he stood with a telephone to his ears. His paws were tied. The bat-winged monkeys hovered. I'm convinced that we start off with the mark of God's thumb upon us somehow. I tried to say that in one of the lectures. Whatever it means to say we're made in the image of God, there is this holy place inside ourselves, which gets all sorts of abuse and battering and knocking about and so on. And uh, a lot of, I think, what we're all of us trying to do, or from time to time trying to do, is to get back down into that holy place, to listen to the intuitions and the, uh, the wisdom and the sources of healing that are inside of us. And I think, in some people, the process becomes so sort of covered over that it's hard to no, but I think uh, a lot of people would, would know what I'm talking about when I talk about that. My anorectic daughter was in danger of starving to death, and without knowing it, so was I. I wasn't living my own life anymore because I was so caught up in hers. In refusing to eat, she was mad as a hatter. I was, if anything, madder still. Because whereas in some sense she knew what she was doing to herself, as far as, as far as what I was doing to myself was concerned, I knew nothing, nothing at all. She had given up food. I had virtually given up doing anything in the way of feeding myself humanly. To be at peace is to have peace inside yourself more or less in spite of what's going on outside yourself. In that sense, I had no peace at all. If on one particular day she took it into her head to have a slice of toast, say, with her dietetic supper, I was in heaven. If on some other day she decided to have no supper at all, I was in hell. I choose those terms with care and theologically. Hell. Hell is where there is no light, but only dark. And I was so caught up in my fear for her life, which had become in a way my life, that none of the usual sources of life, light, worked anymore. And that was what I was starving for, light. And life was what I was starving for. I had the companionship of my wife, my other two children. I read books. I played tennis and walked the woods. I saw friends. I went to the movies. But even in the midst of such times as that, I remained so locked inside myself that I was not really present in those times at all. Toward the end of C.S. Lewis's Narnia book, The Last Battle, there's a scene where a group of dwarves sit huddled together in a tight little knot, thinking that they are in a pitch black stinking stable, when the truth of it is that they are out in the midst of an endless grassy countryside as green as Vermont, with the sun shining and the blue sky overhead. The huge golden lion Aslan himself stands nearby with all the other dwarves kneeling in a circle around his forepaws, as Lewis writes, and burying their hands and faces in his mane as he stooped his great head to touch them with his tongue. When Aslan offers the cringing little knot of dwarves food, they think it is awful. When he offers them wine, 
They think it is ditch water. Perfect love casteth out fear, John writes. And the other side of that is that fear, like mine, casteth out love, even God's love. The love I had for my daughter was lost in the dark stable of the anxiety I had, anxiety I had for my daughter. The only way I knew to be a father was to take care of her.